Welcome to the third YPAT webinar. Uh, this time we are have a, a guest, uh, Mr. Dr. Mehdi Khoury from the University of Exeter, who is an expert in serious games. At CCWI last September and understood what serious games could do for the water industry. So I invited Mehdi to present the whole concept of serious games to you at the y in, in, in a YPAC webinar just to show you the possibilities of, of what can happen and how we can use serious games to explain really complex stuff to the customer and how that can help the customer understand some of the situations the industry faces. So I'll let you take over Mehdi. Hey, and that will be, uh, it will be my pleasure to answer them directly online. So this session is going to be interesting in the sense that I'm going to make you try some stuff. If you've got a web browser, uh, particularly the Chrome web browser on somewhere on your laptop. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start by talking um, a little bit in general about serious games so you get an idea of what this is all about. Now, um, what are serious games? Um, okay, it's basically games which are made for a purpose other than just entertainment. Uh, so let's say you need to train people to understand a complex system, then you could use a serious game to do that. Or uh, you need to communicate with um, oh, so uh, <clears throat> to get back to it, um, yeah, you could you could use Serious Game for many things. The the idea is you can also use it for uh, connecting with customers and stakeholders in ways that were not uh, foreseen before. So there's a couple of of principles that that make it, if you want, uh, more obvious and. One of them is uh, people learn better by doing. So you could give people an 80 page long report about how to learn how to operate a pump or something like that. Or you could um, give them a game and through that game, make them experiment with the device, the virtual device of the pump and get used to it, operate it and then they will remember much better. So there is this this um, ability that people have to to remember better by doing. Uh, another another bit is um, you know you're all familiar with engineering uh, challenges, uh, but the one of the major factors that come in is once you solve a problem with an engineering solution, quite often you've spent 95% of your resources to solve the engineering problem, but the last 5% is quite often to get people to adopt it. And uh, this last 5% is actually a big wall sometimes. Um, I mean, there are lots of examples of technical solutions that failed spectacularly, not because they were not working, but because people were not adopting them in the right way. So, Serious games is actually kind of a nice way for people to um, play with the system if they have preconceived ideas or bad habits or, or views on how to do things properly. You make them view through the game what are the best solution or what are the worst things that they could do in the context of that problem. And by themselves, it will lead them to um, you know, revise the preconception, and then uh, and then get on with the problem in the best rational way. So it doesn't sound like much, but uh, this is actually a pretty good thing, especially when you have to connect with um, many people and stakeholders for for problems that involve lots of different types of stakeholders. Uh, I'm going to show you very specific examples, so I'm not just going to 
you know, talk about it in the air, you will see the, the prototype and all that in action. Uh, finally, there is another thing, which is, um, well, technologically speaking, making a game, a multiplayer online game, was something difficult until recently, because now the technology, the internet, uh, web browsers and all that, it's become prevalent and in order to make a game that would connect lots of people so they could play with an online model and uh, through this online sandbox they could change whatever is going on and then they could see, experiment with it all online together and get their act together as a team. To do that nowadays only require one programmer and a couple of weeks. Well, in the past, it required a team of, of, you know, software engineers and quite a lot of work. But the technology has matured so much that from an investment point of view, it's mature enough to, you know, you, you, don't, you don't need much, much investment to get something working. So um, these are the three factors that, you know, make serious games an interesting option. You add on top of that a bit of a circumstantial problem, I mean, environmental problem, which is climate change. You would wonder why. Well, um, recently, some of you might have heard that uh, the regulator in the UK of what has just fined uh, Thames um, uh, River, uh, Thames Water, they've just been fined like 100 million or something huge in, uh, you know, because they didn't have enough, um, a good enough engagement with their customers. So you can't help thinking, well, now might be the time to use novel tool or better tool to engage customers and get them to see your side of the story. Uh, you could, you know, send them questionnaires about the quality of water or things like that, but you could perhaps also try to get them involved through something like serious game you could actually show them your side of the story you could show them um, what are your resources and with your limited resources where you should uh, prioritize um, whatever it is you have to invest in and if your customers through a game can check what are the limitation and make a rational choice toward a solution then in a way not only you have engaged them, but they will also support you. So um, <clears throat> this, is, um, this is another thing that makes Serious Game an interesting proposition, especially if you are a service provider, because with climate change, the regulator is going to get more and more tense. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, they're going to start this blame game and quite often the first victim is the service provider, water service provider, energy service provider. So if you can, if you can really justify and show that you really tried to engage people in lots of ways, that might go a long way. So, yeah, I think I'm going to stop making a case for it and get uh, straight into it. So first of all, uh, I'm going to show you a website so you can feel free in your own time, whenever you want, to download the materials for the first game I'm going to present. So this, uh, you will see this address, this web address there, the Nexus Series Game, Millbrook. <clears throat> so in here, uh, if you have a Windows computer later on, uh, you could... Um, download by clicking on that particular link, the zip file, but be wary because this is a, not exactly an ordinary game. That game, once you unzip it, it takes 50 gigabytes of space on your hard drive. So just make sure if you were tempted to try that particular game, that you have 50 gigabytes free. <clears throat> and I'm going to demonstrate that game to start with. Um, so. Let me give you an example of a game we developed for getting in touch with residents, stakeholders of the village of Millbrook in Wales. So what is the problem? This is Millbrook and uh, unfortunately for the residents in this village, they have been flooded multiple times in the last few years. 
let me uh, give you a little overview. So this is a virtual table. This is what our serious game is uh, for all purpose for the residents of Millbrook. This is how we presented it. And what you are seeing is a little bit of history about the problem of Millbrook on this virtual table. So, you know, not all serious game need to have the same design at all. It's just this one was designed so people can actually read uh, stuff about the, the flooding problem, the erosion problem, what's going on. So there's a whole context about the history of the village of Millbrook. And once you have uh, in front of what you have in front of you is actually a miniature version of the village of Millbrook. Uh, and once you've uh, you have a slider here, and if you if you do uh, slide up to 1.99 hour or something like that, this is actually the peak of a flooding as it happened in Millbrook. So we got a model behind it, and what you're seeing there when you zoom on the village, <coughs> sorry is that you got um, lots of houses in red. When houses are in red, that means you got more than 50 centimeters inside the house. And when they're in orange, there's between 30 centimeters and 50 centimeters. So what does that mean? Well, for a little village like Midbrook that has been repetitively flooded in the past, this is catastrophic because that's where the, the pubs uh, of all things are located. And also uh, the pharmacy, all the commerce, and lots of the residences. So um, I was invited to come to a workshop which was organized by the Southwest River Trust. And um, uh, there was a, a really a big problem. Um, basically, people in Millbrook, the residents, were very, very tense. They were convinced that the cause of the flooding was that this reservoir that you can see over there was over flooding inside the village. But it's actually not what was happening. They were given a very detailed technical report by uh, the wastewater company, but the resident believed that the reason that they were flooded was that the reservoir was over flooding the place and also they thought it was because they didn't have big enough sewer pipes under the village. But the sad truth was uh, the level of the reservoir during the flooding was actually much, much lower than the level of the flooding in the village. And in fact, the reservoir was saving a lot uh, of the, the, the problems. At the same time, if you look at the detail of the Millbrook surface around the village, you notice it's at the bottom of a bowl, right? I mean, it's literally at the bottom and the hills all around it. If you look at the detail of the field, it's actually intensive farming with cow fields so you could probably see the little cow fields with the path um, so the the, the intensive um, herding kind of uh, cattle uh, uh, is is uh, the cows compact the earth take away some of the grass and then the water is not absorbed directly by the ground it just flushes straight to the bottom of the village and it's the same principle is <clears throat> with mice cultivation that you can see over there. So if you if you if you if you look at the whole picture, and I'm gonna show you right now. Um, you've got this village around the village. The we have divided it the area the catchment between three sub areas because there's three farms that own the terrains around the village, and we're gonna. What we've, what we've done is we've showed people, residents, what can happen flood-wise if you change some of these things. So, let's say you try to find a hard engineering solution to your problem by replacing the existing wastewater pipes with bigger pipes. So, at the moment, you've got a low-cost infrastructure. If I click there on the high level of infrastructure investment, we're going to double the amount of money to increase uh, you know the amount of water we can absorb with with the sewer so if i click there it's going to take a probably a, a little while to yeah so i click between the two and you will see this is actually no difference the flood print is pretty much the same no matter how much money you put into getting bigger pipes under the village 
Now, what happens if you drag and drop a different farming system in one of these three areas around the village? Oh, that's a different story. So at the moment, what we have in Millbrook is heavily grazed permanent pastures, a mix of heavily grazed permanent pasture and intensive arables. So I want to show I want to show people, I'm gonna put that a little bit on the side here. I want to show you what happened when you um, have the mouse over the different types of farming system, you can drag and drops. You can drag and drop over the, the different area of the catchment. So here we got this heavily grazed permanent pasture and each type of farming system has different properties. It will change the water infiltration rate it will change the terrain roughness. It will also change the amount of sediments that you create and that can possibly block the drainage pipes. And finally, last but not least, it will certainly change the profitability of the farming. In the present situation, intensive, you know, heavily grazed pastures is actually not super profitable. It's, it's mostly subsidized by the European Union, at least it was until a few months ago. And uh, it's not necessarily the most profitable solution for farming either. So the different farming solutions that you can see are some of them, for example, are starting to use rotation to have different types of crops. Uh, some of them have start have um, no till or minimum tillage. So what happens is you would uh, just uh, pierce little holes on the ground, put the seeds and uh, not till the earth so that you don't disturb it too much and you leave a little vegetation cover of beans or something like that. What happens when you do that, uh, there is a lot of little roots that take um, the, the soil and create microporous holes and all sorts of things. So what, what happens if we drag and drop this green farming system into our tree areas? Will it change anything about the resulting flood? Yeah, it will. In fact, not only we have neutralized 95% of the flood or more, but we also have improved farming profitability. And we can do that without needing an expensive infrastructure investment. Now, I can see that somebody is typing Ricardo. So, hi Ricardo. Uh, I'm gonna click on the list of attendees. Let's see if I can uh, indeed uh, see if there's any question going on. Well, I'll wait for a minute um, if I see your question. Okay. So, um, this is an example of. Yes. Ricardo, these uh, alternative scenarios are actually preloaded. What we did is we, we, we used um, a hydraulic simulation system uh, and we, we also modeled in advance every square meter of the terrain with the different properties that it could take with infiltration depending on the farming surf. We also modeled the, the wastewater system and finally, we modeled the profitability of the farming isolately. The models were not super, super precise. What made it interesting was that we combined them together with the soil property that uh, would uh, change with the farming. So everything was pre-simulated and stored in advance. That's why it's 50 gigs big when you actually unzip the game, because there is more than 430 possibilities that results from the number of combinations of the different uh, things that you can change and investigate. So this is an example of a serious game which is not dynamic in there because we pre-ran the simulation and stored them in a small mini database which is self-contained with the game. Now I see Sally Watson is typing. Uh, so uh, I'll keep I'll be keeping an eye on on, on the questions. Um, so this is an example of 
you get people to explore the space uh, if this is deterministic or statistical um, actually that's a good question um, it's a physics based hydraulic um, model so you've got data about how much rain you got and you know the the soil properties and all that and the 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 gpus which have been computing the result give the same result every time with the same if your input parameters are the same so i do think it's a deterministic physics model that's behind that and not strictly speaking um a statistical one So, uh, you, I'm being asked if you can point to specific form to change behavior. Yes. So in here, I've divided the area in these three areas because there's actually the, the farmers, um, they, they do have, it's a bit rough. Okay. It's not the exact way, the way they, it's not the exact way that they own the terrain around the village, but if you change and you use that kind of, for example, uh, farming system for this farm this area then you have a different result so you can point to a specific area of the terrain area of the catchment more than a particular farm but yes uh, that depends how you you basically model it so if you if we wanted we could have divided the terrain in much smaller units um, and or much bigger Um, so, okay, so this is cool because what happens is we allow people to look for the space of all solution and the game in itself is not sufficient. So what you're seeing is a nice piece of, uh, oh, uh, hi Oliver, yeah, okay, um, I'll see you, I'll see you soon. So yes, what you're seeing is a nice piece of software, but in its own, when you want to engage people, it's not necessarily enough because they need to understand what's going on. So um, if you go to the website link that I did show you, this link, you have access to the kind of document we did show people. The first document is an introduction. So if you click on that Google Doc link, you will be shown uh, the online document. Um, and um, you will see things like, thank you for participating uh, in this game. Uh, you've been given the opportunity to look at the Millbrook flood problem. Uh, and then there's a few generalities about where Millbrook is and, uh, you know, they've got a problem and blah, 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 and all that. Now, this is uh, usually you need some, some sort of general introduction. Now, what is interesting is the design of the game is actually a good old psychology experiment. Uh, you give people a questionnaire in which um, they have to reject or confirm some hypothesis about the solution to the problem of Millbrook. So this is an example of the questionnaire people were given before they play the game and they are given the same questionnaire after they play the game. This way we look at the way they answer the, the, the questions and we see if playing the game has introduced a modification, a change in the way they, they, they perceive the problem. And we use statistics. So if we have a statistical significant difference induced by playing the game, then we can prove that playing the serious game really indeed changed people's perception of the problem. If you cannot prove the playing the game has changed the way people understand the problem, then you have wasted your time and your money. There's no point making a game if you cannot really prove that playing that game actually made people change their understanding about the problem. So it's an important thing because making a game in itself is great, but it's not enough. You actually need to be able to evaluate the impact it has on people. So yes, this is an example of... Um, you know, the type of hypothesis you ask people to confirm or reject before they play the game. So, um, improving the village sewer infrastructure that directly drain excess water could result in neutralizing most of the flood. Do you think so? Do you think that? It's kind of reasonable reasonable to, to think so if, if you're not familiar, if you haven't played with the game. So when people are given that, 
that questionnaire, you could bet that most of them will have preconception, or if not preconception, they'll have an opinion on what the solution to the problem is. And once they've played the game and they have seen that the solution doesn't lie in having a more expensive set of pipes under the village, but in actually changing the farming systems around the village, then they will answer very differently that question in after playing the game. So I'm going to show you right here typically the kind of result we had um, with, with, with that. So uh, some of these questions, I, I, I can't remember exactly what was question two or question three, but these were similar hypotheses to what I was just showing you. Some of these questions, this is how people answered before the game in yellow. So you see when they, and, uh, they were asked to confirm or reject a hypothesis, uh, four of them were neutral on the subject, around six or seven of them agreed and six or seven of them disagreed. So they were kind of distributed, they were not sure, okay? One of these questions, one of these hypotheses, they weren't really sure about the answer, they didn't know about it. But after playing the game, this is where you got the answers in red. And you could see it point toward strongly disagree to disagree. So you got a strong change induced by playing the game. And the same went for this other hypothesis shown there, where immediately people tended to be between neutral and agreement with a vast majority, I mean, not vast, but most of them being neutral about it because they didn't really know. But after playing the game, after playing the game, it was between be agree or strongly agree. So this is the important bit of uh, you know being able to connect with people, but more importantly, getting them to understand the problem, explore the solution space, and 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 then come up with satisfying answers that go in the direction of what you've modeled. Um, now the design of the game itself wasn't just giving people a questionnaire before playing the game and after playing the game. What happens is if you just people, if you lay, if you leave people in front of a game like that for one hour, well, they're gonna click some random stuff and they, they're not really necessarily gonna understand what there is to understand about it. So what you need to do is you might need to direct them a little bit. Um, for example, while they were playing the game, I ask them, and I click on the Google Doc, I ask them to explore these given questions in the order given so that they could understand more about the solution space. So the questions were exploring, you know, the different outcomes. So what is the combination of measures that leads to the worst flood outcome? Um, can you note the amount of damage that's happening in this worst solution? And then another question, which is exploring the complete opposite. What's the combination of measures that led to the best flood outcome? And then you can ask them more complicated questions. So what's the combination of measures that minimize the flood, but bring you an acceptable financial outcome? So what's going to cost you the least and make this flood as small as possible? So this is where it gets interesting, isn't it? Because you get people to explore the whole space of all possible solution, the measures they can take for uh, limiting the flood, and then you have to, you ne then you get them to take into account costs as well, and then you get them to start doing this, you know, optimization problem in which they've got to minimize flood and at the same time minimize cost, and you could add extra layers of dimensions of things on top for other types of games, especially complex flooding problem in which there might be more than one or two perspectives as far as stakeholders are, are concerned. So now I've just given you a general, not just an introduction to the game, but also I've shown you how it's designed and how you get people to, to engage with it, to revise whatever opinion they had. And the, the, the key part of the design, um, and I'm probably just repeating myself on that one, but you know, it doesn't harm sometimes, is to make sure that you've got this hypothesis in a pre-game questionnaire, 
then in the post game questionnaire and then in the middle when they play the game to have this series of questions that helps them a little bit to explore different aspects of the problem and once you've got this then you're set you're set for that type of game which is about you know engaging residents and stuff so um more um <clears throat> like to the the fact is what, what what was the effect in the terrain on the ground of playing that game for the people in millbrook for the residents like this is kind of funny because only two people only two residents from Millbrook actually turned up to play the game the rest were other people chosen at random whoever we could get sometimes engineers working in water or other people I mean, all sorts of, 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 of people were, were selected. But what happened is one of the two people that came to play the Millbrook game was the accountant of the parish. And believe it or not, I don't know if there's a lesson to take in there, but as soon as the accountant played the game, very soon after <clears throat> the parish uh, meetings, they started to uh, literally change their financial priorities and instead of investing in bigger pipes which was a costly endeavor they started to support the farmers so that they could change the way they were planting uh, their, their the terrain around the village so this actually playing that game with only two of the residents led to a direct change of the financial priorities and the way they were supporting the farmers around the village and I suspect this particular template doesn't necessarily only work for Millbrook. This problem is probably something that can be repeated in quite a few places in the UK and, and not just in the UK. All right, so I've shown you one example of game uh, and I've been, you know, talking about it and all that. Now I'm going to show you something completely different that you guys can play if you wish to. Um, all right, so let me um, show you. There is this website. If you Google Symphonexus, so um, let me spell it Symphonexus. I'm going to copy that in the chat. I'm going to copy the address. So if you've got a Chrome web browser and I'm very specific on that you need a Chrome web browser to be able to play the game otherwise it's not going to work <clears throat> unfortunately the programming team is uh, me so you got one person as a programming team so I didn't have time to make the game for like different browsers but if you go there you will be directed to the main website if you've got a tab a Chrome tab or something open on the side and if you go to output then there is something called Sayus Game there. If you click on it, you'll be redirected to this page. And on this page, there is a link here, just located here, which is actually the access to the Symphonexus Sayus Game, a very, very different type of game that I'm going to demonstrate right now. And you'll be able to play with it at the same time to make it a little bit more interesting. Um, I am seeing some sort of updates. I don't know if anybody is. Uh, yes, the the name host has left the meeting, but that's that's okay. And that. All right. So um, if you click on the link, what will happen is you'll be redirected to the site. I would personally advise you to actually take the time to sign up to create an account because after you've played the game then you can see how you've done on the ranking board of scores in the game and therefore your performance also it will stay kind of anonymous will you'll still be able to see it and we can discuss on what policies work best and all that so in my case uh, I'm gonna log in as uh, myself But you could also play as guest if you can't be bothered with the login stuff. Actually, I can just do that right now. I'll click play as guest. And what happens is you will be redirected to the, 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 the choice menu. And this is the Symphonexus project, which is a, a game for policy makers about the Nexus. And here you've got this map. And I advise you to select 
that country, the interface, Azerbaijan. This is the game that works. All the other games are in, at the experimental level at the moment. It's not, not, they're not ready. The Azerbaijan game, which is a fairly simple game, is ready to, to try. And when you have clicked on the map on Azerbaijan, if you click on play here, you will then be redirected toward, you know, this little questionnaire of hypothesis. You don't have to fill it in. You can click on skip if you want and just get to the game itself. We're not doing an evaluation uh, right now. And once you click on that, you now are redirected toward the game interface. And this one is very different. It's a it's a browser in browser game. So you get a little introduction, same pattern as before, and uh, a couple of uh, a series of questions in which you could explore by answering the question in the given order the different solution space of the game, a little bit like in Millbrook before. And you've got a few few things about control. So you are advised to use a mouse if you can because <clears throat> it's just easier to control with a mouse. Uh, in my case, uh, I'm gonna show you a little bit what's going on. So Symphonexus is this big gigantic European research project in which they want to model the nexus of water, energy, land, food and climate. And the the goal of that particular game is to save the nexus. So let's just say there are things happening, let's say climate change and things like that. And you want to make sure that the health of the water part of the nexus and the energy part and the land part and the food part and the climate part is overall quite high. You don't want to just, you know, have a cheap, plentiful of energy, but have the rest of the, the, the problem just sinking. Um, so this is a game for citizens, scientists, um, not exactly school kids, but let's say more like students, um, but also possibly policy makers. The idea in there is uh, there's no school for policy making. And these technical things about water and energy have only been modeled um, isolately in silos. So usually if you are an energy service provider, you don't necessarily think about the consequences of what you're doing for the water sector and vice versa. If you're a water service provider, you might not necessarily be too worried about what you're going to the impact of what you're doing on the domain of water, food, land or, or, or climate. For that matter. So this particular game is actually quite simple when you look at it. You've got to make sure that your nexus health is as high as possible. It's the average of all these five health bar that you see in the rainbow, water in blue, energy in yellow, green, uh, we've got land and food in brown and climate in purple. So if you don't do anything, if you just do business as usual, you start the game in 2020, you end the game in 2050. And you would click next turn. I'm not using any policy at the moment. I'll get to that. And if I click next turn until the end of the game, you will see business as usual. That is to say, you're not using any policy, you're not trying to improve anything. But this is where you end up at the end of your run. So you can see climate that you started um, in a in in a nice. You can right click here. Um, so okay, the controls. Um, if you've got a mouse, you use your right mouse clicking button. You leave it clicked, and then you you move around with the mouse, and that's your panning option. So you can, if you've got a mouse wheel, you can zoom in, zoom out. If you don't have a mouse. You can just use your arrow keys on your computer or you can use Z and X to zoom in or zoom out. So the controls are also on the keyboard. So what happens here is you haven't, you've just clicked next turn until 2050 and you've seen climate going down, uh, water kind of going up a little bit uh, and uh, food um, going down slightly and land use for ecosystem uh, and all that going down pretty steadily. You notice that 
uh, here you've got these cards so what happens is if you click on the button there you have access to different policy cards so there is some policy for water for energy for land for food and we've got one policy for climate in which you're trying to reduce the carbon footprint in food production so the health of climate water and energy are calculated from policy scores so what we do is if you want to look at the detail of how you calculate the score of water it's actually uh, if i click on this button it's actually an average of this big policy scores which are called water supply measures and water saving and they are themselves calculated from smaller policy objectives which result from taking different policies and if you right click if you've got something with a little hand if you right click on it you can actually get the detail of what this is so for example the water supply measures the score result from uh, these two policy objectives which are management of existing resources and salinity in the Caspian Sea so if I go back to the overview we have a view on the general the general course so this is what we did business as usual we didn't drag and drop any policy card now what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to copy paste the URL on top go to another tab and paste it press enter and we can restart a new run exactly at the beginning but this time I'm going to drag and drop a few cards for example I'm going to drag and drop uh, energy awareness energy uh, efficiency policy I'm going to drag and drop another policy called sub subsidies for renewables and another one called direct investment in renewable and I'm going to click next turn there is a dynamic model behind that it's not a pre you know calculated stuff there's actually a server in Spain which is running a dynamic model that's going to take all the input variables and when you apply the policy it's going to change something and you're going to have a different output you notice that when I've drag and drop this policy cards, I've got this thing appearing on the Gantt chart. The rectangles are not fully colored the first five years because it's the time it takes for the policy to be built in reality. So it's not going to be active immediately. You need to wait five years for the policy to actually take effect. So I click next turn and nothing should happen because the policies are not active yet. So if I click next turn again, then I will have a change so let's see what we've done we've drag and drop this renewable kind of uh, energy policies and before when we had business as usual you would see the climate thing staying pretty much getting slightly worse and the energy stuff going up so you would get energy a little bit cheaper every time a little bit more of it well, in the other scenario where you've actually dragged and dropped this energy renewable policies, your Nexus health score for energy is actually going down noticeably. And your climate is actually going up. So I'm going to go back to the previous one was flat, the purple line. And here it's going up. Not by much, but you know, you're not going to increase climate massively just by increasing three policies obviously uh, it's a it's something you can influence little by little so what's been happening what's the explanation behind that why, why would energy go down well the, the thing is if you apply you know these renewable energy policies it might have a, an impact on how cheap and plentiful energy is and in fact it's probably not as cheap as using coal or nuclear used to be so um, energy is going to be a little bit less accessible but at the same time the counterpart is you improve your amount of greenhouse gas emission and you notice that the the, the health of the climate is actually derived from computing this policy scores which rely on um, the emission surplus, so the difference between the greenhouse gas emission and the greenhouse gas sequestration. So we've done something. What if 
instead of using these energy policies, we actually reset the thing, the drawing board, and we just use this climate policy about um, reducing the carbon footprint in food production. Well, what will happen? So let's 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 be a different policy maker. Let's just drag and drop that thing. Notice that when you drag and drop a policy, it takes resources. So you got a, a number of token, which is virtual money, and also show, social cost. So to make the game a bit more interesting, what you want to do, <coughs> sorry, is increase your Nexus Health score, but try to minimize the amount of expenses. But you can play the game in as many ways as as you want. I mean, there's different ways to play it. One could be have a different budget for every five-year period, a limited budget in which you can only have to choose very few policies that you can afford. But in that case, this game mode has unlimited budget, so you can really try whatever you want, uh, as it's more like a, a tutorial kind of game, um, an introduction or what. So if I click next turn, the policy is not active yet. It's going to be active now. So what happened? Um, actually, nothing. See, um, you would think that by reducing carbon footprint or food production, you'd have um, had a significant impact, but there's no noticeable impact. If 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 I if I go back here, uh, sixty nine point zero nine percent, and you're still at sixty nine point zero nine percent. So. I'm not saying the model is perfect, um, but the impact was so small that it didn't even register as a 1% or 0.1%. So not everything is obvious. You would think that some policies have a better impact than others, um, but they don't necessarily do. That, of course, depends on how detailed and accurate your model is, and there's no way around that. Um, so... One of the interesting thing about the game is you can combine policies. It's not just policies in energy, there's policies in water. So, you know, these things might be linked. And now I'm going to show you the detailed view of the game. So far, this was a simplified view. But if you click on the detailed button up right, then you see something that looks a bit scary, but it actually isn't. Um, here, what you see appearing is this complicated looking nested node thing it's actually a view hierarchical view of your model behind everything and uh, the nodes that you can see on the left are the top node the top variables in your model like water balance or energy balance in order to compute energy balance you need the children node which are a bit more on the right which are like the energy supply and the energy demand and so on and so on so this hierarchical view of all the variables in your model show you know which variables which are the children variable needed to compute the parent variable until you get to the most important variables in your model so why would we show something like that well when you use a policy let's say an energy policy you click on the card and then it shows you which variables are directly changed by that policy so for example this energy policy that we've uh, used about renewable and stuff is changing something about the energy, but it also is connected in the nexus to emission, to climate. So that's why you've got an impact on both climate and, and things. This model is, a, is, a, is our uh, first, um, I would say, toy model. So it's simplified. In, in truth, there's a lot more connection with other areas. Uh, we've got more complicated uh, games in development, like Greece, in which you've got a lot more relationship between the domain of water and energy. And uh, we've observed in, in more complex models that, um, in fact, um, the area of the nexus that has the most impact, the most complex impact everywhere else, is uh, when you change something about farming. If you change something about the way you produce food, it has an impact everywhere else. In the way you use water, in the way you use energy, on the way you use the land, uh, but also on the climate. <coughs> and uh, this is uh, 
some of the you know lessons we're starting to learn because this is an exploratory thing nobody actually has put these different areas of the nexus together before so um yeah you're starting to have a picture now you can see there are other things over there in which you could see for example what's the composition of the energy demand um it's mostly domestic uh, services and then industry and transport i mean you could start getting a picture if you if you want to analyze what's going on behind the figures and the model uh, and here you've got actually you can you can click and you can see how variables are changing throughout its time and if you click on one of these things you will you will see the nodes the children in node used to to compute that variable so for example the emission balance if i click on it i will see the two variables which are used to compute it and i can go back and and explore uh, the 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 timeline of how the variables have been changing so this is the detailed view it's not necessarily for everybody but if you start to want to investigate what's going on then you you can have a a, a greater um, idea so we've done that for azerbaijan we've got uh, another prototype in the development which is greece which has 14 different regions and whatever you do in one region will impact all other 14 regions so it's a much more complex example with something like 11,000 variables but it doesn't look impractical when you look at it because it looks very similar to that we've simplified it with this kind of interface so you don't have to i mean the tree here is more complex but we also pruned it and the truth is even here when you've got a gray node uh, you click on it and it shows you the hidden variable that you don't necessarily have to see at first so it's quite accessible all right i think i've given you we're probably coming toward the end of the uh, of the timeline I've, I've, I've given you a pretty good overview of two types of series games one was for engaging you know residents and stakeholders on the flood problem and communicating with them what was the issue another one was more about policy making now it's really easy the in the sense that technology is mature these things are quite cheap um sally is asking what's the timing of the eu project delivery well the stuff should be delivered in the next few months so two three months this is the first one of a series of uh, literally 11 case studies so this country we got uh, we got Azerbaijan, but if I go back in the interface, uh, we also have other countries. So uh, in the case of